uh, Postgres ML is an open source project. Their goal is to bring machine learning to Postgres, and they've done that. Um, with a tool like this, all of that can be done in the database. The training data are on the database in, a, in tables. The models, scikit-learn models and others, can be trained on those data in the database. The model can then be deployed in the database. And then with a tool like Hasura, it can be exposed over the wire as an endpoint, in this case, a GraphQL endpoint. You don't have to write any code. You don't have to write any code to train the model. You didn't have to write any code to deploy it or even have an endpoint. Does I want to see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we are live and back with another episode of the Data and API Show. Welcome to the latest season where we will be looking at all things database, data, all about that database if you're into that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about this. This is going to be a great season for us to be looking at really the core of what makes Hasura shine. And that is when you have a good database and you have a good data structure underlying your API, then Hasura just gives it to you. And that's a really great thing. To kick off this season, I am joined by one of our database experts here at Hasura, David. Thanks for joining the show today. Uh, no problem. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it, Jesse. Yeah. So uh, the first time you and I interacted was at a workshop. And then it was like a couple of weeks later, then it was like internal Slack ping. Hey, by the way. <laughs> so that was really cool. Um, why don't you tell people a little bit about like sort of your, your database journey? Because you've got a very wide database background and I had a lot of different use cases and areas where you've had to work with earlier prototypes of databases to the modern uh, stack we know. Kind of give us a bit of a background about who you are, what it is you do, and uh, we'll kind of kick off from there. Awesome, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, that, that, and by the way, that webinar was great. I liked it so much I had to join the company. Uh, but yeah, so I don't want to date myself. I won't put any dates on this, but I will say that, uh, you know, I've worked in this industry for a long time. I was there for the first dot-com uh, bubble uh revolution and so back at that time i was working it was a client server environment we were building applications with visual basic if you can believe it and old versions of microsoft sql server where at that time it was all about data modeling all the, most of the application code much of the application code was in the database and it's been a long journey in this industry there have been some ups and downs and some twists and turns into other technologies and other ways of architecting things and with tools like Hesura, I feel like we're starting to come back to where we started with, which is in the database. Um, the foundation of uh, so many good applications is good data modeling. As far as my background, um, like a lot of folks, I'm a washed up academic, one-time physicist, moved into software, worked in databases. I've done application development. Um, I've worked as a data engineer moving data into, into and out of databases. I've worked as a data scientist, gleaning insights about data. I've worked as a machine learning engineer, trying to you know, building AI systems off of data. And now I work at Hasura because um, for many reasons, but part of which is I feel like tools like Hasura are ground zero for where I think this industry might be moving, which is back to the database. And uh, I want to be where that's, happen where that's at. So yeah. Yeah, that's going to be a really, that's going to really set the ground for an interesting conversation today because, so tools like Asura, obviously, and if you're new to the stack, uh, for those that are watching this, we're, one of the uh, primitives or one of the, the primary ways we look at building with Asura is that you've got sort of the abstraction of your data layer and the orchestration of your data layer, control, access, the shape, even the federation of it. So what other, what other relevant data sources do we connect to it? Last season was all about that. Um, but when you when you look at some of this sort of idea of abstracting away these services, it becomes a really interesting question when you start looking at things like ML, like academia and like uh, data science, where some of the some of the business logic -y kind of things, they could live in multiple places, right? They could live in 
uh, functions you call downstream from the data source, they could actually live on the database itself. So they're actually sort of really fresh and running at, at the actual uh, metal. Um, and so it'll be interesting to kind of get your take on that from your experience. When do you embed, if you will, the analytical functionalities? Um, and I think we're going to be talking a little bit about warehousing today as well. So sort of like the use case specifically through the lens of a data scientist and your history in academia, I think kind of lends to that. Um, but when we look at sort of where do we where do we embed these functionalities? downstream, which you can do with the sort of actions, events, those kind of things, or do you sort of uh, leverage the database's functionality? Because especially, I mean, we started with Postgres at Hasura, and that ecosystem is so massive these days uh, for for any kind of workload, really. Um, I think there's some really interesting interesting questions here that we can actually look at. So um, where, let's maybe even just start with that as our entry point into a conversation here. When you are looking at Let's let's take it from a perspective of a of a data scientist. What are what are some of the actual like data step problems that you come across typically when you're talking with either our customers or from your past experience? Um, you know what what's happening. I, I know a little bit about data lakes and a little bit about some of the big data problems yeah. that our audience is like really concretely. Where where do we really run into issues quickly, and where's you know, where's something that uh, modern database tooling solves that? Absolutely. So you, you probably know this, but um, within uh, data, if we just think about data, there are broadly overlapping domains. There's big data, there's data analytics, there's data science, there's machine learning, but there's a lot of overlap uh, among them and some themes emerge. So one theme that emerged is cleaning data. That's if you talk to any data scientist, machine learning engineer, or you go through a data science or machine learning boot camp. They will stress, uh, for very good reasons, the fact that not, it's often not very glamorous. A big part of that task is cleaning data, making sense of data. You're gathering heterogeneous data from a variety of different sources, and you're trying to come to some level of understanding of it and presenting it into a fashion that's useful uh, for downstream tasks like um, analytics, uh, business intelligence, data science, and machine learning applications. And so where databases can become relevant to this topic is that relational databases, SQL databases, and other kinds of databases that are sort of general purpose, as we know, there are decades, half a century of experience and tools and knowledge and um, lore about how to use these to uh, process data, clean it, present it in a usable fashion. So that's one area where databases can start to impinge on, on this topic. Um, so <clears throat> that's, that's one way to answer that question. Um, we can reflect on that, or I can talk about some other ways that, that databases. Yeah, let's explore it even some, some bit further. So what are, what are some of the other areas? So, so we're talking about, obviously the, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've thrown a lot of different data sets at Yep. database structures over the years and we've gone through a lot of different ways to look at things from graph databases yep. uh you know no sql databases document stores you know things that that have tried to fit to different uh you know paradigms and i think we're even seeing a bit of a uh, renaissance in some re in some regard of a bit of a return to relational data right. um where people were like Boy, it sure just still fits <laughs> really well it for is. a lot of so, cases, or it's absolutely. easier. So, yeah, kind of, kind of, what's what's been that journey? Why has relational still been so dominant in the field, even though we've had yeah. sparkly solutions? That was a, that was a database pun um, for like for <laughs> things to solve to solve uh, different kind of workloads. But like, why why is relational still so dominant in this space? Absolutely. Uh, that's a great lead. And what I would say is one way to answer that, and this reflects back on, on our earlier topic, which is how databases impinge on, on the work that we're doing, is to organize it along the lines of emerging trends or, or changing paradigms. And so if you allow, from my point of view, you're absolutely right. There does seem to be a renaissance of relational databases. Um, there was a period you know, where, you know, if you allow a lot of a bit of history, you know, 
there was the big data era with large volumes of data. There was the MapReduce paper, the Dynamo paper. MapReduce um, became something that we could adopt with things like Hadoop and Apache Spark. Also, there were, like you say, non-relational or you know, so-called NoSQL databases that emerged in maybe the last decade and a half. And those are driven by industry trends about you know, large volumes of data, new types of industries, social media, things of that nature. And so new tools had to be brought to bear. That's, this was happening at the same time that Moore's law proverbially was running out. And so we had to look for solutions that were scale out horizontal solutions, distributed systems. And the existing databases of the time were sort of suited for vertically scaling uh, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, and they weren't exactly up to the task of handling those volumes of data uh, at, at the time. They, you know, there's since been retooling to make that less true. Um, so new tools emerged, Hadoop, Apache Spark, and it's like, um, it's like any kind of new technology, right? Like you, you start out, you, you start up building a car and the first kinds of cars that were built didn't have airbags or bucket seats or, you know, uh, rear view cameras. They were just a basic, you know, engine and a steering wheel. I just need to get from point A to point B. And so, so new kinds of data systems were built, data processing systems were built and they didn't have a lot of the, um, you know, affordances of a relational database. Um, but as time moved on, we learned that those affordances of relational databases and SQL databases sure are pretty nice. And, you know, researchers and practitioners looking at it more carefully realized that relational databases and SQL were not um, uh, incompatible with these new data systems. They just had to be built. So for instance, uh, Apache Hadoop came out in, I think, 2006. Four years later, 2010, Apache Hive comes out. The, a SQL interface was put on top of Hadoop. Why? Because SQL is it's useful. Um, you know, Apache Spark appeared a few years later. Um, it didn't initially have SQL, but very quickly, uh, the Apache Shark project was rewritten and merged into Apache Spark. And so now SQL is, it comes out of the box with Apache Spark. Um, you know, a few years later, Amazon Redshift was built, you know, built off of, you know, an early, somewhat, somewhat older version, but a still useful version of Postgres's query, query engine, column their data store, able to do a lot of the big data analytics that were done previously, you could now do right in a SQL database that was essentially Postgres compatible. Apache and, and we can stop there, but so. Yeah, so, well, I, I want to jump in there. I don't want to stop trend, there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, let's, yeah. So, so, but, but why the return to SQL based and relational based databases? Is this because the tooling is there, the education is there. And so this was kind of like where we don't want to teach everybody, you know, um, sort of quadratic data stores. Yeah. Or is this something where we're trying to, uh, was it something we just said that relational, fit better for horizontal horizontally scalable systems as opposed to because a lot of times I think I think uh, uh, spark and stuff are not as conducive to horizontal scaling if, if I understand correctly I'm not a database person so is that yeah. that be a fair a fair assessment or what's what are some of the drivers behind this there I think there are several factors so what I would say you know one element is relational databases are fundamentally extremely useful you know, Ted Codd wrote the original seminal paper defining what the relational database is in 1970. You know, it's, there has been decades of research, uh, on this topic. It's, a, it's a simple model, but it's extremely powerful. It has, uh, deep mathematical foundations so that, you know, powerful theorems can be, and have been proven about the relational model which are useful because those things, those, those aspects drive powerful data, data optimizations, query optimizations, um, query planners. So the databases that we get, the relational databases and the SQL databases that we get are extremely powerful. 
that's always been true and that's always been available um <clears throat> so you know the cl it's like the classics never go out of style right so relational databases the relational model is absolutely a classic and we're sort of i mean that, that goes back to ledger days like we you know the merchants coming in and and logging in attributes and however wide exactly. you want to make your ledger so i mean the the model has had historical value mm -hmm. uh, over the years yeah that, that is absolutely true i but then i think you know so that's that's a timeless aspect but then some some of the dynamic aspects are you know changing industry trends so maybe in the in earlier decades there, the volume of data wasn't quite so great. The demands for analytics were not quite so rich and sophisticated. AI and machine learning were non-existent. And so applications were, you know, traditional OLTP, online tr transaction processing systems, wherein the analytical capabilities that are afforded by the database are not being demanded. You know, you're just using the database as a data store for, I've got an online retail store. I just want to record, I just want to record orders. That's it. And in that, in that setting, you know, an object database is perfectly reasonable. It makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, CouchDB, MongoDB, those things are great for those kinds of applications. Um, but, you know, in the, for, again, for obvious industry trends in the last decade and a half, the volume of data has gone up, the, its diversity, its velocity, and the variation and the applications have exploded. Um, and so in that face, uh, something general purpose with deep foundations like SQL is absolutely invaluable. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really nice. Cause I mean, we, I mean, we've obviously seen document or that's just for just broadly bucketed as schema list uh, databases. We've definitely seen them, them uh, have their place gaming other industries where the the object is really not definable or to normalize that out, you would have who knows how many tables. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think there, you know, we've seen them have places and, and obviously, uh, for those that were, were even attending the Historicon, uh, you, you probably heard that we've, we're releasing a data connector kit where people can actually then yep. build connectors for schema lists for multiple different data sources whereas you know the the underlying tried and true still has been relational and it's it's been an interesting comment that i've seen from a number of of people that of our customers in the sciences where they'll say one of the things that's been just amazing about Hasura is obviously uh in genomic data for example where one of our customers is heavily based uh you know sparkle is sort of the the thing right because it's it's a very graphy data but scientists <laughs> uh, and, and where you can source a lot of this content is still like Postgres databases. So you're either tasked with, I need to find a way to con have a continual ETL pipeline of all of, my graph all of my relational data into graph data structures, or what they've said that Hasura has kind of had a, a bit of a powerful functionality with them is that it has allowed them to approach relational data in a very graph-like way. And so they've been able to query things in graph-like structures, whereas with, you know, obviously if you're looking at something specifically of a, of a typical SQL statement, it does get a little verbose <laughs> by hand after a while yeah. if you want to, you know, start to have any sort of self-reflecting -re uh, structures or anything. Um, yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. So you were talking about the analytical payloads. So where... Where do those typically surface the most? So, I mean, we, we have things like where, where your relational is very concrete. Relational is, is something that we're, we're very familiar with. And now we have people building all kinds of crazy analytical functions. I was reading a paper about some data type inside of, you'll know, uh, inside of Postgres where it allows you to do aggregate counts by estimation. So it gives yeah. you a probabilistic, like within a end departure of, of like, it might have a couple of, of false positives, but like, it's really yeah. close. Like it's really Those are things close like enough. Bl bloom filters and there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> HD, HD histograms and count sketches. Yeah. So folks will, will know that averages are really easy to do. Sums are really to do. Median is kind of hard to do, but, uh, but you can, if you can, if you can be satisfied with an estimate there, there are functions for doing that. And this so. is something where the audience normally would have thought that that would have been something that 
traditionally belonged in the, in the domain of a purpose-built database, right? This yep. is something that you would have kind of had a specific, like, okay, this is what our data looks like, and we're going to need to have these functionalities, and you pick a database very specifically for that. But now with, with things, especially like Postgres, and it being a really strong community-led uh, project, people build these plugins and build a lot of analytical function on top of that. Uh, that you can then just plug right in. And I mean, and with tools like Hasura, you, you get it right away. So like, it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, having to now write a bunch of resolvers by hand to surface this functionality. You can take some of these benefits uh, out, of the, out of the box. What are, what are some of the analytical payloads or toolings that you've seen uh, so, so looking at some of the traditional or the the traditional science based or big data based databases like Sparkle or like even um, you know even BigQuery that they, they came out to the surface high level you know data stores versus some of the more analytically focused or or machine learning friendly uh, data <clears throat> data sources. Where where do you see those sort of um, I'm going to use the word bifurcating. I think that's the right yeah. word here. But where, where do you see where do you see them sort of uh, separating into which which buckets? Like when do I reach for which sort of type for which kind of workload? And and from your experience in in academia, like where mm -hmm. where are some of the interesting things that you see being able to be surfaced with uh, like analytical payloads, for example? There's some super interesting applications in, in bifurcations um, and some emerging trends. So you know within analytics, there and, and I'm not. You know, this is not um, an exhaustive list, but there are like so. There's business intelligence, which you know is the province of um, BI tools, Chart IO. Um, you know, there, there are a few others uh, in this domain. You know, visualization, charts and graphs. So that's that's one application. It's just guiding the business. Uh, it's sums and averages and trends. So that's that's one domain. Um, another domain is the province of proper sort of data science, data scientists, data sciences. Historically, often data science was drawn from uh, you know, academic backgrounds. Oddly enough, often from the psychological, uh, psychology and sociological backgrounds, um, because you're dealing with, you know, in in market retail applications you're dealing with people and their weird behaviors um, and so their tools like r i don't know if you're familiar with r r is a statistical package um, a tool and you know a lot of data scientists who come from those backgrounds are conversant with r and so um, tools that facilitate that integrating with the database has become very popular and that's the province of much more sophisticated statistical modeling so we're getting away from you know, plain business analytics is so be, show me the numbers as they are versus investigative yeah. statistical I mean, modeling yeah. of what's yeah. the and, patterns. And if we go yeah. back even further, like big data, like big data was there outside the province of business intelligence. Okay, we had ad networks, right? Ad ne networks were generating huge volumes of data, and there it's not even so much about, um, it, you know, it's not just about guiding the business. It's counting the pennies. We want to count the pennies. We want to count all the pennies. And if you're doing that, you need to process every transaction, every ping from every uh, every ad placement, and you need to do sums over huge volumes of data. That's the province of Google BigQuery, MapReduce, things of that nature. But then uh, business intelligence is averages, trends, sums over smaller sets of data samples. Data scientists would produce much more sophisticated models um, involving like you know, dealing with seasonality in your data, um, uh, developing hy hypothesis testing, things of that nature. But then we get into moving from data science, we get into machine learning, which has sort of now been rebranded as artificial intelligence. And there it's less about building statistical models and it's less about, um, it, it involves academics less to some degree it's less about sophisticated statistics it's more about computer engineering um, how can we how can we train models uh, using the data that we have to produce to make decisions um, and so these are like some of the the, the bifurcations 
all of these different activities are in various ways finding homes on relational databases. Relational databases and strangely, interestingly, Postgres, PostgreSQL itself have been um, targets for a tremendous amount of innovation and research in all of these areas. As you know, like Postgres has been a target for developing so many applications. Again, we've mentioned some of them. Amazon Redshift, built on Postgres. Greenplum, built on Postgres. Uh, CitusDB, built on Postgres. Um, there are ML databases built on Postgres. So many tools are, 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 have, so, have chosen Postgres to be the lingua franca, not just SQL, but Postgres itself to be the lingua franca of applications and data and analytics. But as you mentioned before, there is SQL. SQL is great. We love it, but it is a little bit verbose. It is in some ways you know, a, an Achilles heel. Uh, it is difficult for folks to work with in some, some cases. Also, you want to get access to the data uh, in, in other, uh, along other channels. Uh, you want to expose your data online. You want to have an API. You don't necessarily really want to expose a SQL API. So how do you do that? Um, there once was a time, because you really didn't have any other choice, where you had to write code. You didn't even have GraphQL. You weren't even writing resolvers. You were writing code. You're writing REST endpoints. Or in a decade before, you were writing objects in a middle tier. That's how you that's how you grapple with your data, just to get it over the wire, just to get it out of the database and over an HTTP endpoint. Uh, and while you were at it, while you were doing those things, you might as well put some business logic in there. But now with tools like Hasura, you can get that API. You get the best of both worlds. You get you get SQL for backend processing for any sort of analytics that you need to do in that domain. But when you want to expose those data or those functions over the wire, Hasura is right there. You don't even need to write resolvers. And so in that setting, that's great. But then it leaves, it opens the question, great. OK, where do I, where do I write my code? Where do I put my business logic? Um, so that's, that's maybe a topic for another one of these sessions, because that takes us away from data analytics and into application development. But um, yeah, but I think that's a that's a yeah. strong point, right? Because because uh, SQL obviously, there's a lot of a lot of things that uh, can go wrong <laughs> if you expose that to the front end, um, yeah. and even, even if you expose that to people with with non escalated per, uh, permissions internally, yeah. and where GraphQL has fit into a nice bill. So you you had the then the pattern of well, we're going to just hide this behind um, either a an ORM of of sorts that gives us some protections, or we're going to put this behind a um, you know, like API uh, endpoints, and you, you can do all of that. And that's been, it's worked for a long time. Whereas with the GraphQL approach and specifically with the generated GraphQL approach, because like, again, this is what, what Hasura gives you is it gives you basically an 80% use case API out of the box without having to do any of that. You can just wait for the, for the um, uh, differentiated workloads, like custom functions and views and things. Uh, or exposing the the specific plugins you want to add on top of your data set, and and with GraphQL you're able to say, okay, actually you as the front ender you have access to these models and these fields because we protected that. Again, I'm going to speak from the Hasura perspective because this is just kind of what I know best. But like we can we can lock it down and say, yeah, if you have access to it, you can use it. <laughs> if you don't have access to it, you're not even going to be aware of it because we're not even going to expose it. Whereas and so that's where this introspection part where we have kind of a strong tie between the front or between the app developer and the back end that doesn't have to be communicated. Obviously, documentation is, is a different topic and you can definitely do that in a smart way. But you can sort of have this strong relationship where, I mean, imagine an introspected SQL interface that would be a wild, <laughs> a wild bit of tooling to try and set up in place and very and very fragile. But if you actually with GraphQL, you can just out of the box see, okay, I have access to these fields. And this is something that I'm allowed to put into the interface or use for whatever is needed. And, uh, and then the different systems have access to scoped permissions of being able to access that yep. data. So it's kind of yep. like seek a self aware SQL that is uh, also limiting the subset of what data you're even able to access, which is sort of the perfect case. It's like yep. SQL, but 
with the guardrails, with the strong tie, with the fetching paradigms, with the uh, education, all of it kind of built in. Um, yeah, so so I'm curious then. So as we so you see, you were kind of uh, saying that you know we have sort of the the business intelligence of okay basic analytics and term or basic averages, basic uh, sums, basic whatever we just kind of want to see from the business side. Those those probably can run more or less against the production database. In most cases, you know they're not going to cause a huge slowdown situations where you're actually looking for seasonality in your data sets yeah. or uh, or abnorm abnormal access patterns or whatever else it might be. Um, mm -hmm. Those probably are things that you're wanting to create these these truly random sample sets or, or even just be able to create copies of the data. And those probably don't do best to live on your production database, but are more or less, is it kind of common to slice it off and yeah. then look at it? Absolutely. So a couple of, the, I mean, you know, the more databases, the better. So, you know, there will be many production databases and, you know, as you know, it's a, it's a well-worn path to split your workloads along OLTP applications and OLAP applications to use some sort of terms from a bygone era. So OLTP applications being online, your online application, you're running your store, right? Customers are coming to your, your retail application. They're making orders. You probably don't want to run uh, analytics workloads that are performing aggregates of your database. <laughs> data on that database. Uh, and those are to, you know, more write heavy workloads, but then you will through, you'll, you know, through well-established ETL processes, you'll take those data over into a data warehouse and data marts, data lakes, but typically a data warehouse where you'll have databases that are organized to support analytics workloads, um, which are, you know, read heavy uh, uh, workloads with lots of aggregates. So that's one split where you'll, where you will divide your, your, app, your applications into those two different domains. Everyone understands that it works great. Um, but then moreover, on the analytics side, uh, there are approaches where you have, I mean, the most unstructured approach is a data lake where you just throw everything in there. You have CSV files and you have images and you have audio files and you have JSON documents. Um, and then you try to make sense of that. But then maybe a level of organization above that is where you have a, a data warehouse that is general purpose. Uh, but then there are circumstances where you have other databases that extract data from the data warehouse or from a data lake and organize it for a particular use case for data science, data scientists, for sampling, for fuzzing, sampling, like fuzzing. medical data, for example, yeah. you can't be just taking slices of healthcare yeah, exactly. data. You gotta exactly. be fuzzing yep. it and, and yep. surfacing it. Yeah. That's yep. yeah. There, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, business being developed right now in, in healthcare about creating fuzzed data that is still um, scientifically significant yeah. because you, you want to add, and I, I've done some, some startup research in this space, um, but like you, you want to be able to surface what is unique about these 500 people living in Philadelphia with these common health markers, right? Like that, that's actually substantially significant, also highly identifiable. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so you're, and so there's this line of a, okay, how do we start to, this is a, a whole space people are investigating, but how do we fuzz the data in a way or, or be able to surface these patterns, which potentially can even just save lives. How do we surface these patterns in a way that is not going and make it available for the broader side of the community to be able to see other patterns elsewhere without again, like saying, this person in this house is probably going to spend a lot of money for that medication that you have. Uh, so send on the, the ad mailers and stuff. Right. So, um, Absolutely. yeah, that's, that's, that's a good example yeah. of like a special purpose application, but there, there are, there are many different you know kinds of examples of special purpose applications. Um, and we talked about some of them data business intelligence is a broader category. Machine learning is, another one of those sort of special applications and sort of common trends are whenever there is a frontier 
then you know new tool new tools will, will be developed that are purpose built to deal with the the things that are encountered in that frontier but then as time progresses the frontier becomes it's not the frontier anymore it becomes developed you get proper cities and roads and you get fire departments and libraries and it starts to look like uh look like anywhere else it starts to look very familiar and so that's happening in let's say machine learning and data science so you know the purpose built tools in let's say data science and especially machine learning these are things that many folks will be familiar with but you know python tools like scikit-learn um uh there's um and NLTK, which is a natural language processing toolkit. Many of these things are developed in Java or Python, but they're they're purpose built for for specific applications. I want to build a a, a word to uh, vec net. translator. I, I want something. yeah, I want a, a word to vec translator. I want to build a neural net. I want to build a deep uh, you know deep neural net. I want to do image processing. I want to do audio processing. And so there would be special purpose tools for those specific applications. But one trend that I think I start to see emerging is there is a convergence onto common platforms. And of course, the vendors who have those platforms have an interest, they have a financial interest in supporting those workloads or saying that they support those workloads. So for example, Apache Spark. Apache Spark is an open source tool, but uh, you know the, the um, the for-profit business that sort of behind it is Confluence. Yeah. Confluence has a managed version of Apache Spark. Confluence, it's in their interest to say that it can handle that workload. So can you do machine learning on Apache Spark on Confluence? Absolutely. Um, can you do machine learning on Apache Spark in Confluence using Spark SQL? Absolutely. Amazon, they have uh, they have Spark, of course, but they have uh, Redshift, which is a SQL database. They have uh, Spectrum, which is a SQL database, which is a SQL, it's Redshift over uh, S3. They have Athena, which is another relational, form of relational database. They're poised to say that you could do machine learning in SQL on those tools. Then there are other uh, we, we could talk about the details, but there are other projects which are whose whose objective is to allow developers to do their work, let's say producing machine learning models in Postgres or in MySQL or in SQL Server. So it, it's yeah. no longer the case. It's no longer the case that you had to fire up your editor and start tinkering with some obscure Python library. Um, Machine learning is becoming um, retail. <laughs> there are, you know, you no longer have to invent the tools. You can just grab the tools right off the shelf. And some of them are right in your, your favorite. Your and favorite sitting app. on the actual metal and, and running in yep. real time and, and yep. built in cron functionality. But well, there's an underlying uh, thread there, what you were just saying. I think this is a great transition for us to kind of move into a bit more of actually looking at some, some code um, yep. or some modeling is, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, Apache, Apache um, SQL, you're talking about, you know, Redshift's own language and, and some of these other tools. So the, the up and coming business or the business who's trying to embrace some of these large data sets or, or data store uh, technologies, they're having to either go all in <laughs> on, on one specific uh, paradigm and maybe they are multi-cloud. Maybe they actually have a bunch of different workloads that are, you know, they've inherited this one from there. They've got this one set up over there and they're onboarding the latest acquisition that's, uh, you know, a couple of pizza pizza startup kids with a Postgres database or whatever. So maybe they've got all these different mm -hmm. kinds of data sets. And I think this is one of the areas where Hasura will also again begin to shine is that it allows you to surface a lot of these native functionalities into a unified approach. So yeah, maybe you need to have one person who's an expert on this topic or you know, a couple, whatever, to be able to expose some spe specific functions and write some functions against the database that are, are unique or some of those other kind of behaviors. But then for the rest of the team, they're able to, ex to access again through the permission controls what they have access to 
because it's exposed right away inside of the Hasura API. And then it's a matter of permission controls and saying you have this and you have that. Um, let's uh, let's have a look at one of, you mentioned you had a couple of analytical uh, data sets or, or big yeah. data sets that we can have a look at. Pick, pick your favorite database and let's just kind of have a look at it and see how fast we're able to see a very non-vanilla functionality um, surfaced inside of the GraphQL API. You got it. Is it all right if I share my screen to do that? Go for it. Yep. All right. Let me see if this works. There are many, many, many examples. I'm not advocating any particular approach. This is just an example. Uh, so this is uh, Postgres ML is an open source project. Their goal is to bring machine learning to Postgres, and they've done that. Um, so, and they, there, there are all of the usual marketing content about how to grab this and how to use that. We don't need to really worry about that. Um, but I've set that up on my machine. My machine. They've got some demo data. Let me just flip over. It's all right with you to a SQL uh, editor just to show you. This is running on my computer. This is Postgres. Um, I hope you see a kind of a black screen. It's uh, a SQL client. So if we look at the um, schema within here, there is a PGML schema. If we look at the tables within PGML. Are. Right. Okay. So they, these are example data that they provide us and there are functions within the depth. So there are, let me, let me set the stage. So, you know, a, a, a one common way of working is you want to build a machine learning model to let's say, um, uh, make judgments about the likelihood that patients will be susceptible to diabetes based on health markers. You'll have data in CSV files. You'll write Python code. You'll use scikit-learn. You'll do a regression model um, that will be then deployed possibly as a microservice, which will then be called with say a rest endpoint to generate a score or a likelihood based on health markers that someone will have diabetes given the data that have been trained to trained on that model. With a tool like this, all of that can be done in the database. The training data are on the database in, a, in tables. The models, scikit-learn models and others can be trained on those data in the database. The model can then be deployed in the database. And then with a tool like Hasura, it can be exposed over the wire as an endpoint, in this case, a GraphQL endpoint. You don't have to write any code. You didn't have to write any code to train the model. You didn't have to write any code to deploy it or even have an endpoint. I want to sense? see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. It makes it makes sense. It's difficult to fully yeah. um, appreciate, yep. I think. So we, we'll look, it. Yep. So let's so there they have this oddly these are all example data sets. Um, they you can do breast cancer detection, diabetes likelihood, uh, identification of handwritten digits. And there's this oddly named one, O E N E R U D, which is, I believe, exercise data, um, P G M L. Right. And what? It, and there's, you know, these are these are toy examples. These are examples that they provide. So you really just, you know, imagine if you will. Um, but what do we have here? We have okay. So we have people who are they're doing exercise. They're doing chin ups, and sit ups, and they're jumping, and then we have. Uh, some other attributes of these people, their weight, their waist size, and their pulse rate, right? So these are these data have been used to train models to see. I do assume this is meaning the circumference around their body when it comes to waist size as opposed I to- I believe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, when it comes to fitness junkies, you never know what people are measuring. What they spell exactly. there is, yep, yeah. So, yep, okay. yep. So, um, there, you know, these things are tracked in, in a bunch of. So there, there are functions which I won't, I won't bore you with that were used to train models. The models are, are, um, let's see. Uh, well, we'll just look at the documentation. Let's look at one, see what it looks like. We don't have to implement it, but just to see kind yeah. of what what somebody would be implementing to do it. Yeah. Um. 
I see not output flushed. We're just continuing along with the with the theme here. So yeah, yeah, yep. yep. Um, so we'll put that as tables in PGML star. Okay, so they, there's a um, okay. We'll select. Um, I, I swear I won't torture you with too much SQL PGML uh, projects, right? So they have this idea of so, so these are the projects. These are pro so there are projects within the database okay. for which models have been trained. There, okay. are the, mm -hmm. you know, there is this um, uh, exercise versus physiology. So let's select star from models. And it's a regression model. Yeah, we can see that. In this that case, it's a regression model. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Where uh, I think it's project ID equals one. You know? There we go. So they've trained a bunch of different models for. Okay, they have. They've. They've. So this is an example where, in they have use this very small set of data to train all of the different classifiers. You can see that they provide uh, a ton of different models in, uh, that are available. Uh, and they've just trained all of them. But then they've deployed yeah. certain, ones, certain ones of them. Uh, OK, so I'm going to switch over, if, it's, if that's all right with you, in the interest of time, to Hesura. Um, because uh, I have taken these data that are in these data and these tables and these applications that are in the database and expose them over her server because why not right so here we have and to, to expose that you just added the database endpoint underneath the, the data and then you just said track these tables that's it was just that easy yep it's just that easy so here we are in here are those data that we saw before, there are data for breast cancer, diabetes, digit classification, flower classification. What kind of flower is this? And we have these exercise data. Here you see chin ups. And then we have these predictions along. These are predictions for these three uh, metrics based on chin ups, sit ups, and jump, jumping jacks, I guess they've done. What do we expect their weight, waist size, and pulse to be? Again, there's not much data here. You know, there, there aren't too many insights to be gleaned from this. This isn't a very realistic model. Uh, but you can imagine with a lot more data, this would become a real model that could actually be used. And you could start to set up uh, endpoints where you could, um, let's say, for um, here's our exercise data, you could say, well, you know, what is um, what is their likely pulse given that they are, um, well, I'll, I, I'll have to, <laughs> I did yeah, this in a matter but, of minutes. So but, you can, yeah, but you like, know, a, matter, like a story of, I would, yeah. I would, set up, what I would set up a, so in, in Hisura speak, what you would do is you, you would set up a, you know, for folks who are familiar with, uh, Hisura, you can track tables, you can track functions. So like I've tracked these tables, I would track a function in Hisura that would accept chin ups. Jumping can, can we can we do that? Do we do we have the time for that? Um, let's give it a shot. So uh, let's see. So what we want to do is create because um, like one one example of where where that might be is if somebody were to give in their current heart i just talking from the product person's perspective here uh, yeah. so i've got my i've got my heart rate you know as resting heart rate of x and and i've been doing these many push-ups on my workout routine and i say my target heart rate i want to get it down to i don't know drop five beats per minute on resting and it might say uh a workout that you can do to do that might be to increase the amount of jumping that you're doing because we see predictably that people who do the most amount of jumps have a overall lower uh, resting heart rate and so that, that might be a way where the model could then predict to us Here's a here's a workout model for you based on the kind of workouts you like doing or how much space you have available. 
blah, 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 filtering down on those kind of pieces of data. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where uh, yeah. that sort of prediction becomes helpful or useful is because now you've taken data that frankly you could just capture any old way and then actually turn it into something that is meaningful of being able to help somebody figure out how they might be able to hit a very targeted goal. Um, so, you know, whether we actually get this to work in the time allotted. Yeah, <laughs> a, but we'll still see, really, uh, still, we'll see, the, still see how we expose a function and right. track it. Right, so the approach would be something like this. So, you know, so in this particular case, they provide the, the function that, that this particular tool provides out of the box is PGML predict joint probability. Um, that's not joint as in a uh, part of your body, but a, a joint of two data sets. Um, and it accepts a, the name of a project that has a deployed model. And then the data that uh, the, the, um, the factors that go into the prediction, and then it will generate a real number. Um, this, as yeah. who are familiar with Hasura will know, if you want to track a function in Hasura, it, as a, say, a table or as a computed field, it has to have certain properties, like it needs to be um, returning rows as opposed returning to returning rows. Yeah. It needs to be non-volatile, and it so happens that that's not necessarily satisfied by this particular function. So we would have to wrap this function with another function that we'll call say help, which is let's say chins, which is a real number, um, sit-ups, which is a real number, jumps, which is a real number. Um, Returning, let's say, um, table of, um, let's say, weight. I'll say real, 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 uh, table. Um, and then as, right, and then you would say, Turn. You know. And volatile versus stable. What's what's that referring to again in, in uh, SQL land? So um, there are in Postgres there are functions can be volatile, they can be stable, or they can be pure. So a volatile function is something that um, it is independent of the data that are passed to it. You, you cannot, it's not guaranteed that you will get the same result um, for the data that you pass to it. So an example of a volatile function would be the random function. Random function is absolutely independent of any of the data. Um, a stable function will give you the same values for, it'll return the same value for the input, um, but it may have side effects. Um, it may, it may send a message. It may write something somewhere else. Um, a pure function is, it's a promise that it's also side effect free. It only returns values. It doesn't have any other effects. It doesn't, um, it doesn't write to any tables. Okay. It doesn't delete any data. Um, so those are, those are just some, some expectations that Hasura has around uh, functions that you can track. Um, but so to do this, we would, and I, I, I probably won't get this to work, but it would look something like. Yeah, well, you know, well we're, I mean, we're not asking you to, to yeah, create yeah, a health yeah. startup here on the spot, but what we're, what we're wanting to see is sort of how you would then be able to Both expose yep. a yep. function on the, uh, on, on, in a server, because I mean, this is again, for an example, it may be that this is something that we had to write in, in Sparkle SQL or something that's a little bit more yep. um, esoteric. And we maybe don't have somebody that does that, or we just want to hire somebody yep. who who's a contractor who comes in for a week or two, writes out all the functions that we've identified from our, our statistical model into the language of the database, and then is able to actually expose that. Um, I writes that, and then we, we can maintain it, but we were able to just not have to make everybody else in our team become an expert on this topic. Right, right. Um... So it would look, you know, it would look something like this, if I could get this to work. But um, you create this function. Once you satisfied the requirements of Hasura, then this would be a function that you would track. It would appear here as an as an untracked function. You would track it. Might need to be refreshed first. I'm not sure. Sometimes the UI needs to, yeah. if it's uh, 
did it actually uh, create or? No, let's see. Let's see. Um, SQL has the best errors. <laughs> it does, yeah. Uh, returns. <laughs> returns, there we go. Look at that. Might even, that might actually even have worked. Select false rate. 50, 50, 50. Awesome. Okay. Now, what does Hesura think about all of this? Here. So just uh, just to summarize, because we'll have had a bit of a jump in there. So yep. we wrote a function. The, we're using PGLM or PGML. <laughs> that, PGML. Yep. Uh, uh, that has a has the ability to train models directly on the database, which is something that we were wanting to be able to do because downstream, whatever else, it just adds in extra layers of, of obfuscation. And we're saying, you know what? We can actually do this on the data set itself. We were able to then go ahead and take one of their example functions, which happened to be volatile, wasn't something that we could necessarily track out of the box in a way that GraphQL would like and thus Hasura would have a problem with. So we were able to say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and create a wrapper function for this kind of behavior. And we were able to make that function uh, just, you know, modified it a little bit to, to work with what we want to do here for the demo case. In this case, we're just returning back the pulse itself. We're creating sort of a return table that just has the individual pulse. We made that function, and so um, obviously, you know, there was a little bit of our debugging in there. But let's say we spent the last ten minutes defining a a business function critical function, like it's a, a business value critical function. So we've got this this SQL function created. Now we're going to go ahead and just expose it inside of the Hasura API. So if we head back over to Hasura, well, how do we get this into our API now? So the rest of my team doesn't know how to write SQL functions. That's exactly for right. PGM, no. Yeah. And and honestly, it, it didn't take us that long. And most no, of it was, no. is, was just me fumbling with not remembering how to create functions. Uh, but you can see that the work involved is minimal. Uh, no, I mean, if, now, if you were to yeah. launch this feature within 15 minutes like we did, I don't think any PM is going to complain. Yeah, exactly. And if, <laughs> and if we had, if we had, a, exactly. And if we had a large volume of data, this would be a real pulse rate function that would actually do something useful. And there right. It is. So if we go ahead and let's go ahead and track it and see how we yep. get this into the track system here. Field. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Consistent. Okay. Well, we need to track pulse. Track the pulse track table, table first. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Why don't we do that? And then. Um, and then go back to the data, uh, back to the little level of our schema yep. so we can actually track the function. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Track as a root field. Success. All right. All right. Now let's go Shipping. ahead and take a look inside of the GraphQL API. So how do we actually yep. get about to use this now? So now there's this pulse rate. And we can say, well, um, let's pass in our chin-ups, our jumping jacks, and our sit-ups. Which, by the way, I want to see those, those 50 uh, pull-ups the next time, we, next time we meet. Oh, oh God. That's, OK, we're meeting in. And then we're returning the, yeah, then we're returning the rate. <laughs> Turn the rate and a little luck. It's running the function. There we go. There we go. And, and, and so, I mean, that did that. It ran, it ran the analytical sample against our data set and it returned back. This is what the estimation of your uh, heart rate should be if this, if these are your metrics. And, and this, is, uh, this, is, yeah. this is, yeah, and this illustrates a real use case. So, a, a com like common activities that I've been involved in the past, you like, so if it's not a pulse rate. How about performing a sentiment analysis on a document? Um, is it a positive or is it a negative um, uh, review? Um, classification: is this is this document likely to be spam or not spam? These are things that are done in a machine learning setting in real world cases, and they're deployed as as you know the data are trained. So, and, and it's a multi step process where you write code in Python let's say, to train the data. And you have to decide, well, where am I going to train that data? And you think about things like, am I using Spark, or am I doing it on my local workstation, or am I doing it somewhere else? And then you develop a model. And then you have to think about, OK, now how do I deploy this? Now you have to write a microservice, maybe in Python again, using something like Flask. And now you're deploying a real application, a real service. All the, these non-functional concerns come into play, like logging, monitoring, resiliency. You have to think about all of those facts. You have to deploy this as an endpoint. With something like Hasura and 
let's say this tool that we're using here, all of those activities could be done in one place, a database. Your data are in the database, you train your database, you train your model in the database, you deploy it right on the database, and then it becomes available as an endpoint like that microservice, but through Hasura. This could be, again, sentiment analysis, it could be image classification. The, the, the applications are, are numerous. And you can go pretty deep. This particular, this particular you know, machine learning tool supports not just simple you know, linear models, but there are deep learning models here. There are fine tuning models on uh, things like um, OpenAI GPT and Hugging Face. Um, you can do natural language processing. And there, this is just just one example. Um, Greenplum, uh, an open source analytics uh, database built on Postgres, they have another approach to doing machine learning, which works relatively similarly. Um, but yeah, that's that's just an example in a nutshell of what can be done. Yeah. So this is, I think, really was the the benefit we we could see. And I'll go ahead and pull your uh, screen off here on the yeah. I will stop wrap sharing. up there. Uh, this is the benefit we see, right? So instead of instead of shipping a bunch of, of uh, you know a whole new stack to support this one function, that maybe is like you know it's the library is in is in R or whatever, and like uh, this is basically we have an entire Python stack for these two functions or whatever, yeah. and then the rest of our application is actually a Java stack or there is a node stack or whatever else. Like this is a very common occurrence with app development. And when we are able to see cases where the databases are evolving and maturing and supporting more functionality natively, then Hasura allows us to move all that abstraction onto the database itself, expose that at the data layer, and, and not even need to use things like the actions and events that we have support for, but be able to just say, actually, the database is getting really, really good and is able to handle this on its own. And I think that's a really, really powerful use case. And I think it's a really great use case to actually kick off this whole series on databases, looking at how do we look at some really obscure stuff like machine learning on the database and expose them to a GraphQL API, which we did like within about 20 minutes total. And that's something that I think if any PM out there or, or business owner would be happy about. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> for, I think this is a great, this is a great kickoff. Yeah. yeah, this is a great, this is, I think this is a great kickoff. And this was, this is a bit of an avant-garde use case. I mean, we're not just, you know, doing simple, uh, reporting simple data out of the database. We're not even um, developing a basic application. We're doing machine learning on the database and deploying it. This is, um, this is bleeding edge stuff. We yeah. Just in a matter of minutes. Um, yeah. Is, and oh, like, I mean, you're, you're, you're the scientist, but like, we're just a couple of developers. We're like you, we put our pants yeah. on one leg at a time, you know, yep. it's, uh, it's how, it's how this, uh, this whole system actually enables and empowers teams to just be able to build much better software. David, I really appreciate you coming on. I know that I kept you a little longer than I promised. So no problem whoever at all. yells at you for your next call, you can send it my way. But we really appreciate having you there. We're going to surface some of this content as well in Docs. But uh, we'll see you all on the next show next week, next drop on Wednesday. We're going to look at even some more database uh, stuff. And, yeah, if you have any specific things you'd like to see or, or have us look into on this show about databases, send it our way on Discord. We're happy to hear. And until then, we will see you next week. Bye.